I think everybody's ready. It seems like we're now having our summer. Just hopefully no fire danger. No fire, yeah. Well, I want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, thank you for coming. You'll have to tell all your friends so that they can come to the next one. Kind of a light crowd tonight, but hopefully more will be coming in. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Mountain Heart and Patio for their community support of tonight's meeting. Um, you'll notice their, um, their information is at the bottom of the flyer. And our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts. They're not to support or oppose any development, issue, political agenda, individual person, or business. Those are kind of for area council values. So there will be no questions during the, um, or comments during the presentations, but at about 8 o'clock, we will have an open house segment, and at that time, you can ask all the questions you can think of um, and talk to the presenters. So what is going on around here? First of all, we have Mel Melanie Swearingen, who is the director of the Conifer Area Chamber, and she's going to tell us an update. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on um, what the Chamber has going on. The goal of the Chamber really is to support our local small businesses and to really help them grow and succeed. And we do that in a couple different ways. One of the ways that's coming up is we have some big events, big community events that are coming up. The first one is our combined Chamber event, which is next Thursday um, over at the Red Barn. And that is with Platte Canyon, Evergreen, and Conifer. And then we also have our um, wine tasting and festival of trees coming up November 21st and our Christmas in Conifer on December 5th. And the theme this year is going to be a magical Hollywood. So keep your eyes tuned in for that for more information. Um, a few updates on businesses. I have talked with Natural Grocers and they are going to be announcing their grand opening date in the beginning of October. So they don't have a final date yet, but they will be announcing that soon. And then also I've talked with Bill Downs who is with Evergreen Commercial Realty and he is working on the property in Kings Valley. And he currently has a number of businesses that he's talking to, including a veterinarian, um, a liquor store, an arcade, um, a deli store, a Walgreens. So none of that is finalized. He's still working on that. His um, realty business will be moving into the executive suite in the next month. So you will start to see some more activity in that area. Um, and that's it for the chamber. Keep all the, you know, what's going on at the next chamber or the Conifer Council Town Hall meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, next we have Peter Barkman. He's with Conifer Area Council. Um, he prepares the Conifer Area Developments um, updates every town hall meeting and in and between. So he's going to give you a little update on what's going on around here. Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, you'll see the uh, development updates are in the handouts you've got. Just a couple things I'll bring to your attention. The uh, Jefferson County Planning and Zoning has uh, issued their first draft of the Conifer 285 Corridor Community Plan. This has been in, in the works for over a year now. Um, and they have, all, have submitted four comments and the period for comments was uh, ended yesterday. But they also plan to have an online, sur online survey. So keep, uh, keep your uh, eyes out and see what happens with that plan. Um, the county is also considering some changes to uh, transportation regulations and what's interesting with that is it's to include bicycle and pedestrian circulation as an integral part. We'll see what that means for the Conifer community as this moves forward. Uh, that there will be a county commissioner hearing on September 29th on that. Other uh, developments in the area, uh, the, the St. Mallow Retreat Center, which will be out uh, off of uh, Schaefer's Crossing at a community meeting on August 20th. The uh, next step, they will submit their formal application based on a community meeting, and then we start watching for referrals, and then uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, a planning commission hearing and a uh, county commission hearing. That's a long road to go. We'll keep our eyes out for updates to that. Other than that, uh, what Melanie mentioned about the uh, natural grocers, uh, that's, that was one of the uh, topics we were following, and that's 
no longer sitting there waiting to see what's going to happen with the property. And as all you can see, there's a, a building taking shape. Another one in the residential, this is why we keep an eye out for these. There was a, a case of Blue Ridge subdivision that was back in 2009. I think with the improving economy, it had been sitting there uh, stagnant and they've resubmitted and they're now going for their final plat. Uh, it's in the uh, referral process and the applicants are revising for the, the comments. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, and Peter has given you the names and phone numbers and everything. If you want to get involved in any one of those updates or developments, um, please feel free. That's what that is all there for you for. Um, okay, so next we have Janice Spiker, and she's with CDOT, and she's going to give a bit of an update on Schaefer's Crossing and I think some other things. Jenna. Good evening, everyone. My name is Janice Spiker, and I'm a resident engineer for CDOT Region 1 um, for West Program, which encompasses this area of 285 in your community. And as Shirley said, I was going to provide you guys an update on the 285 Schaefer's Crossing construction. As you probably are well aware, it's underway, and they have... Um, already uh, installed drainage improvements and poured the concrete median foundation system for the cable rail barrier itself. Uh, next week, they're gonna go ahead and drill holes to set the posts and we'll continue to um, work on setting that cable rail system um, up through the middle of October and they're anticipated to be complete at that time. Um, we don't have a whole lot of other active construction going on in the area. I did want to report that we uh, did meet with Peter Barkman and the Conifer Area Council Group and their trails group to discuss some opportunities for um, trail enhancements in the area. Uh, we're definitely in the early stages of planning that effort, but we wanted to uh, recognize that we met with them and we think it's headed in a positive direction. So uh, please feel free to come by and see me if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Tina Francone, who is our director for RTD, was not able to come tonight, um, but she gave me a little bit of an update and she'll be here next time. Um, she wanted you all to know that there are five lines being worked on. The one that most everybody is interested in, not especially up here, but um, a line to the airport. And that um, line should be done about April 2016. Then also in the conifer and um, evergreen areas, you might see green vans every once in a while, RTD green vans. Those are for the use of everyone. They're not just handicapped vans. Um, they're, they're kind of looking, they're doing a study right now as far as whether they'll be able to keep them because they have not been utilized as much as they should be. So if, um, if you need, you know, is call, call ahead and um, use, utilize those green vans. Um, something I didn't know about, so maybe some of you didn't either. But anyway, something to, to think about. And she will be here at the next meeting. Um, next, we have um, Rebecca Winning with the um, Jefferson County Library. And I can't remember exactly what your title is, Rebecca. I don't have my sheet in front of me. But I'm going to let you tell everybody. And um, she's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on with all the libraries, um, a possible mill levy coming up, and especially the Conifer Library. Rebecca? Thank you for having me um, join you tonight. First, there are no truths. There's no truth to the rumor that we're thinking of closing the Confer Library, <laughs> number one. But we do have a mill levy initiative on the ballot for November, and so I'm here to give you some information, some facts about that. The uh, Board of Trustees um, approved putting a mill levy initiative on the ballot in July, and the county commissioners passed a resolution to formally place it on the ballot in August. Um, we're seeking an increase from a maximum of 3.5 mils to a maximum of 4.5 mils, so a one mil increase, and that will cost the homeowner of an average price home in Jefferson County $1.95 per month more. Um, so I'm here to tell you why we're um, going through this initiative. The last mill levy increase for the library was almost 30 years ago in 1986. And since then, demand for library services has exploded. 
We have 130,000 more people in the county. We're serving 240,000 more cardholders. We're hosting 1.6 million more visits annually. And we're circulating 6 million more materials every year than we did in 1986. All of that's expensive. And if you think about how library services have changed, in 1986, laptops were just being introduced. Everybody had those great big bulky desktop computers. The internet was just beginning to be commercialized. Most of the internet use was still used by government. And now when you think about how people access information, you have to have access to computers or the internet or you're completely disconnected from the 21st century. So libraries have had to expand their services from the standard books and other materials to now offering equal access to technology and all of the digital content in the universe. So that's expensive. We can't provide 20th century, 21st century services on a 20th century budget. On top of that, the recession hit the library especially hard. Since 2008, we've been operating at a reduced revenue. It's about, on average, $2.5 million lower than it was in 2008. And we've been operating at that reduced level for seven years now. So even though the economy has recovered, the library's revenue has not. And in order to bring expenses back in line with revenues, we've had to cut library hours twice. Our larger libraries are now open only open one eight-hour shift a day. Um, so we can't have both morning and evening hours. If you're a mother with small kids and you want to go to the Evergreen Library to have story times and teach your kids early literacy skills, you can only go two days a week. If you're a business person and you want to stop by the library after work or you're a student and you want to do your homework after school, you can only access the library two days a week. This is the biggest complaint we have from residents throughout the county and one of the things we really need to change. Um, we've also, uh, we have fewer, we're investing fewer dollars in materials. Our materials budget, which buys all the books and materials in the library, is a million dollars lower in 2015 than it was in 2008. And when we look at materials per capita and compare ourselves with other light libraries across the country, we're operating in the bottom quartile in that measure. So we really need to restore the books and materials budget. Um, I've had to lay off staff, including uh, nearly 70 full-time equivalents, and uh, we're not able to offer the level of service that our patrons have come to expect. We're falling behind in technology. When we look at area libraries surrounding us, Adams County, Douglas County, Arapahoe County, Denver, they're all able to offer a much more, um, more current technology and a richer experience with technology for their patrons. So we're not able to offer a competitive level of, of service to our residents, our students, and our families. We've had to delay repairs and maintenance. When the economy fell apart, we started delaying capital projects unless they were um, crucial to, to um, patron safety or operations, or they can give us a big, quick return on investment. And as a result of that, we now have more than $14 million of capital projects stacked up in our pipeline that are unfunded. And I'm not talking about building big, beautiful new libraries. I'm talking about replacing worn carpeting, fixing broken window seals, repairing or replacing parking lots that are past their useful life, upgrading our technology infrastructure, things that we really need to keep the library safe, welcoming, and inviting to our patrons. So when we look at that benchmarking, when we're doing our strategic planning, we compare ourselves against a basket of like-sized libraries with similar populations and service areas. And we're now performing in the bottom quartile in all of the major key service measures. We're talking hours open, staff per thousand people serve, the number of public access computers we're able to provide per thousand people served. Um, there are more to more, but they're not coming to my mind. And I only have 10 minutes, so come talk to me afterwards for more of those details. 
So it's time to do something, and our board said, yes, we need to get more revenue, but before you do, go out and talk to the community to find out the services they want and what they're willing to pay for. So we did, we spent most of 2014 looking at resident surveys, doing community input interviews, talking to as many people as we could. Um, the inputs represent feedback from more than 5,000 Jeffco residents and the things they want, there was broad alignment. People want more hours. They want to restore hours to pre-recession levels. They want more books and materials. They want updated technology. They want safe buildings. And they want to stabilize the library's finances. So when we took those and put those priorities into a five-year plan and a 10-year forecast, we discovered it's going to cost us at least $32 million over the next five years in additional revenue just to catch up. So we can do that with a one mil increase. And what you'll pay, 67 cents per $100,000 of home value per month more. But for that minimal investment, you'll get <coughs> libraries you can actually come to when it's convenient for you. You'll get better books and materials. You'll get updated technology, better buildings, and you'll secure the future of the library for the foreseeable future. So I think that covers most of the facts. And uh, my colleague, Patrick Klein, here, and I will be at a table after this if you have questions or anything else you'd like to know. Oh, I have two minutes left. Oh my gosh. So um, I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. It's not very often that we have somebody that's two minutes you know, ahead of time. We <laughs> usually we're getting up that sign and it's time. So time goes fast. Um, okay, well we have a fairly new operations manager at Stockton State Park. And um, he probably doesn't think he's new anymore because he's been there for a while. But this is the first chance that we've had to introduce him. So Zach Taylor is the operations manager now at Staunton State Park, and he has brought Mark with him, and they're going to let us know what's new at Staunton State Park. Good evening. Um, yes, I'm Zach Taylor, and this is Mark Lane, he's our park ranger. I appreciate the extra time. Uh, there is a lot of stuff going on at Staunton State Park, and I definitely want to touch on some of those. Um, right now, you're looking at two-thirds of the full-time staff. Uh, we have three full-time employees to manage uh, just almost 4,000 acres of land. Um, and within that, we tend to hire between eight and 10 temporary employees uh, to assist us during the summer. Um, that hiring process usually starts in February. Um, so if you know of uh, people that have uh, some time on their hands and would like to uh, work in the outdoors and assist us with management of that park, um, we start looking at uh, hiring staff on that February, early March. I want to bring that up. Um, right now, we're looking at um, the addition of oh, about six miles of trails. Where we just got the final contract of bids um, yesterday for the Elk Falls Trail. I know that's been on the minds of a lot of uh, people. Um, we're hoping uh, within the next couple of weeks, if not three, to start breaking ground uh, to actually get access to the base of the waterfalls in the western section of the park. So we're pretty excited about getting that trail underway. Uh, we're also about three weeks away from getting bids and the application process out for construction on our service center. Um, this is a service center that will house uh, about five offices um, for our park staff as well as our area wildlife staff. Um, it'll have uh, about a thousand uh, square foot uh, multi-purpose room, um, which we're really excited about as um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has uh, created a program um, that provides funding for school groups um, for school buses um, to bring those groups to the park. And this last April, we actually had about four school groups of about 50 to 70 kids each session come to the park and, and take uh, ecosystem tours, tree tours, rock uh, uh, tree tours, um, and this multi-purpose room will provide that support, especially in those April and those rainy uh, months when those school groups come out. Um, those programs were uh, such a big success that we're actually having about six school groups come out uh, between now and the second week of October. Um, and I think most of those programs are about 80 kids each. So we're looking at some pretty big programs and pretty, uh, a bunch of schools coming to the park. So we're pretty excited about that. 
Uh, we actually just recently received, uh, well, in, in early 2014, um, the cabin district actually was listed on the National Historic Registry. And through that, we were actually able to get a grant from uh, the Colorado Historical Society to actually begin improvements of those cabins. And so we're pretty excited about that too. Um, there's nine structures in the park that we're looking to uh, build up and repair back to those early homestead so that we can provide that educational opportunity not only for the visitors but again those school groups to come up and see exactly how the Stauntons and those that homestead in the area lived back in the early 1900s. So we're pretty excited about that grant. We got that going. Uh, we actually want to take, talk about a new uh, trail that we actually just opened Friday. Um, and we'll have some more information in the back in regards to that trail. But it's a trail that takes you from the Davis Ponds Loop and ties back to Staunton Ranch. Right now, that Davis Ponds Loop is about a two and a half mile loop, so it's one of the smaller loops. And then the next uh, size of a loop that we have in the park is about eight to nine miles. And so this, this connector, I'll actually give you a, a shorter loop, but kind of that in-between uh, trail loop that ties back into the cabin district. So we'll have some more information in the back regarding that trail, as well as all the other projects that we have going on in the park. And could, could have brought probably a three ring binder about this thick with all of the projects that we have going on at Staunton uh, to provide support for the recreation that you guys want to, to come. So I was going to bring a PowerPoint presentation, but I think having you guys actually come out, out to the park and check it out is far better than me trying to show you some pictures on the slide. So um, I thank you for your time. And, um, I'll end a minute early. <laughs> Okay, next we have Mary and Mary Alice, um, both from Mountain Resource Center, and they're going to talk about the High Ground um, award-winning documentary and other information. Here you go. Thank you, Shirley. Oh, Mary Alice. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Mary Hellman and I are here tonight to share with you um, an upcoming fundraiser that we're doing next week. Um, and the purpose of the fundraiser is twofold. Um, one is, of course, to raise money for Mountain Resource Center and the work we do in our community, which is Neighbors Helping Neighbors. Um, the second, though, and more importantly, is um, our fundraiser, our documentary, is about raising community awareness of what our veterans are facing when they return home. About a year and a half ago, we gathered um, veterans in our community for roundtables to find out what it was that they really needed from uh, Mount Resource Center and the community to support them with their reintegration. And we heard a couple things. One was um, that the community really understand what their struggles were on reintegrating. Um, the other was that they really needed some extra support uh, with crisis assistance. And then lastly, um, more opportunities for connecting and social gathering socially. So um, this documentary is in response to that first one of really raising community awareness. Um, but then I also wanted to share with you that we're offering a number of veterans programs now to support our veterans. Um, we're serving about 120 veterans right now. And what we've realized is, and what we've heard from our service people is that when they return from fighting, um, they, they, they're not able to return to Denver metro area. What they're doing is because of the stimulation and um, the struggles with being in a metro area, they're coming up to our mountains and up into our community. And then oftentimes they get up here and they become very isolated and they don't know where to turn for help. So what we're doing is working um, very intensely with Veterans Outreach, with our partners, um, our local post, to really spread the word about our services and really support our veterans and help them with the whole process of reintegrating into our community. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Mary, and um, we'll show the documentary. And Mary is offering tickets tonight, back at her back table, and we're selling them for $10 instead of $15. So if you buy the tickets tonight, they're only $10. And again, we so appreciate your support. 100% of the money goes back to Mountain Resource Center. And as you'll see by this uh, trailer, it's a very powerful movie that I think will really help um, us all support our veterans. Thank you. I don't really quite even remember exactly what happened. And everything just went black. You know, they ask every year what you want to do when you grow up, and I said I wanted to fight in World War III. I guess I got a wish. People 
still don't get it that not all pain is physical. It's really hard to like re-establish yourself in society. It's just so different. It's like so warm. And some of us don't want to remember ourselves. We don't want to remember our memories. I want to be gone. It's like this deep, dark, black abyss that I stared into. I think there are a lot of occasions in life where you kind of have to reach your breaking point. What are these people doing out here? When I woke up and looked out the window, the first words out of my mouth this morning were, Holy sh! Thank you, Shirley, for letting us show this. I also just wanted to let you know we have two showings of this film, one in Evergreen, and that's on Wednesday, September 30th. And then we have here, right here at West Jeff Middle School, on Friday, October 2nd. Um, we're really excited because the Evergreen showing also, the director, Michael Brown, is going to be there for a Q&A following the film along with the co-producer. So please come out and help us get a great group at both of these showings. And again, all the proceeds benefit the Mountain Resource Center. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, we have had a fantastic summer this year. Um, we've had a lot of rain. It's been gorgeous weather. Um, we haven't had any wildfires. Um, it's just been incredible. But there's a lot of other places, um, California, Washington, Oregon, um, a lot of places that have. Um, it's been dry there. It's drying out here, so we can have some issues too. And we, I think, always have to stay vigilant. Um, we live in the Wildland um, Mountain Interface, and we have to make sure that we keep our, um, our forests healthy and um, free of all the dead wood and everything to prevent wildfires. Anyway, there are some new methods um, that are being worked on, and Jeff Ravage is here to talk about those, and I don't know if you have some other people that are gonna be talking with you, Jeff? Is this just you? Okay, well here you go. Uh, <laughs> if you can explain a little bit about what you're doing and who you're doing it with. That's right, I will. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Ravage, I'm the Northern Watershed Coordinator for the Coalition for the Upper South Flat. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do a quick PowerPoint here. Coalition of the Upper South Platte really got our legs underneath us 
after that fire as the restoration crew for that fire. In that time, we've been doing post-fire restoration and pre-fire mitigation. Uh, we do work on the Waldo fire. Uh, we've done most of our work in the southern part of the Upper South Platte watershed, but I moved here one year ago to begin uh, creating projects here on the North Fork of the Upper South Platte watershed. Uh, we are working on Beaver Ranch in partnership with the Upper South Platte Partnership, which is a new group that is being formed. It is, consists of the Colorado State Forest Service, the United States Forest Service, the National Resources Conservation Service, uh, Jefferson Conservation Service, uh, the Nature Conservancy, American Forest Foundation, and I think I got everybody there. We are going to be doing a lot of treatments in this area using a method known as forest restoration. You want to go to the next slide? So to understand what forest restoration is, we have to look back and see what the conditions of the forest were before uh, colonization by Europeans in this continent. Here we have Shawnee, Colorado in 1896, and here we have it in the year 2000. Historically, there were 60 to 100 trees per acre. There were large meadows that were filled with grasses and forbs, which are flowering plants, shrubbery. Uh, we had a fire return interval, depending upon where you were and what the terrain was, anywhere from five to 10 years to 20 to 50 years, which is in Beaver Ranch about the fire return interval we would expect. So, go on to the next slide. Right now, at Beaver Ranch, we have between 108 and 1,478 trees per acre. The average is 348 trees per acre. This is pretty typical of the forest around here. What has happened is we've excluded fire from the ecosystem, and fire is an essential part of the ecosystem. The fire used to take out all the trees, it used to take down all the down wood, it used to take all of the ladder fuels, which is what communicates the ground fire up into the canopy. A canopy fire is a fire technically that moves independent of the ground. That means the fire is moved to the canopy. When it gets to the top of the trees and it's moving there, it can move 50, 60 miles an hour if it's driven by winds. The lower, more, the more natural, lower intensity fires, and there were areas that were high intensity, but they would go through, clean out all of this, they would put the nutrients back into the soil, and they would keep the fires from becoming these explosive, eruptive things that we're seeing more and more often. We haven't seen a fire, a bad fire, in a couple of years in Colorado because we've had some moisture, but they will come back. So we are committed to trying to get in front of it before it gets here. We want to save the forest, and the way to do it We'll go to the next slide, is to try and treat the forest. Now, for years we've been doing forest fuels mitigation by basically just thinning the trees. We go in and we try and get canopies 25 feet apart, but we leave the spacing that has happened. You know, there's trees everywhere. So we leave a rather even spacing. Unfortunately, this is not how a natural forest looks. And this still, in a hot, dry climate with high winds, which happens in, you know, when we have droughts and when we have long, wet, uh, dry spells, that this will still burn. And it also, because your seed source, your trees are everywhere, the regeneration is going to be everywhere. So in another 20, 30 years, you're gonna to have to come back and do it again. On the other end of the scale is what we call forest restoration treatment. Uh, CFRI, who's also Colorado State University, CFRI, I'm sorry, I forgot, was the other member, has been working for years on doing studies to find out what the forest used to look like. They spent a lot of time at uh, forest and fossil beds, mapping the petrified trees to see what the placement of it was. They've gone into forests and bored into all the trees, finding out which ones were old how they survived through them, and where the trees, the older trees, were placed. And the placement is more like this. 
We have clumps of trees. We have large open meadows. And that is what we're going to try and do in restoration treatment. We're going to try and return the forest back into a more natural condition. So while, and, and it may seem counterintuitive, but this type of treatment actually removes more trees than this type of treatment. Even though it looks more sparse, you've actually removed more to get there because we don't care how far away the crowns are. We make clumps, we make meadows, we make single trees. We look at the species of trees, where they are, and what is the nature of the tree. And so we go through and we try and mimic the natural pattern that would occur in a forest if the forest had not been neglected and if we had not uh, removed fire from nature. And hopefully, and it's been tried, it's a fairly new technique, it's been around for about 10 years, uh, when a fire comes through now, it may burn a clump, but mostly it will go across the floor of the forest. It will do what it does, it will kill weak trees, select for uh, the stronger ones, it will put the nutrients back into the soil, because when you have this many trees in there, there's only so much nutrients, there's only so much moisture in our climate. And it's like having one sandwich for five people. They cannot eat. So the nutrients will go back and the trees will be healthier. The trees will be much more able to take in carbon dioxide. Even though you would think that more trees could take in more carbon dioxide, actually healthier trees take in more. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna open up the canopy. We're going to create these uh, meadows. We're going to increase age diversity. The old way of going through and just thinning out the trees, most of these trees in the forest are very similar in age. You have a lot of old trees. Since they are shading the ground, you don't get a lot of regeneration coming up. A uh, larger tree can compete more with a younger tree. So, what we are going to do is select and make sure that there are seedlings, there are five-footers, there are middle-sized trees. We're going to try and uh, put the age diversity back into the forest so that the forest takes care of itself, so that it reproduces, so that the old trees die when they should, they don't all die at one time, and that there are new trees to take their place. And the big thing is, we are going to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. That does not necessarily mean that we will reduce the risk of fire because fire will occur. What we want is to stop a fire from getting out of control, ripping through the countryside and destroying everything. We'll move on to the next one. All right, so why restoration? We improve forest health. We're going to remove diseased trees, but trees that are overcrowded are more susceptible for disease. We are going to remove any insects, and there is there. Are, I have not found any of the uh, the tussock moth up in Beaver Ranch, but the tussock moth is close, and that is also uh, trees that are overcrowded and that are weak are going to be more susceptible to insect infestation. You make the tree healthy, the tree takes care of itself. A big one is improve habitat. In these dense parts of the forest where you have thousands of trees per acre and there's no way to move around easily, your deer don't go in there. Your elk don't go in there. It's a dangerous place for them. Uh, you change it, the birds don't fly through it. Uh, we're going to reduce wildfire risk. We're going to enhance recreation because you're going to see more wildlife. And the whole thing is we want to do it once and do it right because we want to reestablish the cycle in the forest so that it takes care of itself. One more slide, I think. Okay, this is what the Ponderosa looks like now. Go to the next slide. This is more natural. This is what a Ponderosa forest should look like. Lots of grass and openings. This is more of what Ponderosa looks like right now. We'll go to the next one, because uh, I can see they're going after my time. The last thing we're really gonna try and do in Beaver Ranch is we're gonna try and regenerate a lot of the aspen groves. The aspen groves in that uh, forest have been infiltrated by conifers. The conifers, the pine trees, 
The spruce go in there, they shade the ground, they stop the regeneration of the aspen, and the groves are in decline. From what I've seen going through there, I wouldn't be surprised if 150 years ago, many of those slopes were almost completely aspen. We don't have the aspen to start with, but where we find aspen groves, we're removing every competing tree, and we're going to give the aspen uh, every opportunity to regenerate so that in 10 or 15 years, we're going to have beautiful aspen groves in there. I think there's one more. This is the area of the treatment. It's back behind here. The campgrounds are about right here. The main reason we chose this, this is the big inner slope. Down here is the chapel. The prevailing winds come from the southwest, go to the northeast. Any fire is going to hit that and go right over and then head over outside of the park and spread. So this is the basic area of the treatment that we're going to, do, to uh, work on within the park. And I think we only have one more slide since my time is up. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Coalition for the Upper South Platte and the Upper South Platte Partnership. We thought it was important that we came here and talked to people beforehand about what we're going to try and do and why we're going to do it so that we can get your comments and uh, you can tell other people why are they doing that. Now you know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. That makes total sense, doesn't it? it uh, you know, um, I know we have, we have 35 acres and we're constantly cutting trees and we pretty much are just cutting the dead ones since we have 35 acres, but that just makes so much sense. Well, hopefully everybody can um, talk to Jeff and maybe do a little bit of mitigation on your own um, land. This fall should be perfect. It's in the 80s and 70s and it's going to be a gorgeous fall. Okay, well next, um, the trails team, the Conferry Council trails team has been really, really, really busy. And so we thought maybe it was time to give another little presentation on what they've been doing, um, what the plans are to do, so you know what's going on when you see some stuff happening. So Brooke Kearns has offered to do a little presentation for the trails team. Um, and here it is. Welcome to all of my conifer neighbors, and I invite all of you to join our trails team. We meet the fourth Wednesday of every month at Conifer Library on Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday of every month, Conifer Library at 6.30. <clears throat> Next week, it's the fifth Wednesday, and there is a meeting on September 30th and then again October 28th. And if what my presentation is about interests you, please join us. <clears throat> so, uh, this is just a picture of some trails, and these are the three things I'll be talking about tonight. So, next. <clears throat> this is a photo of Sutton Road, and we uh, put the concrete trail along the edge of it and we did that without using any tax money we went along the county right of way and so it's um, not built with any of your tax money we worked with open space jeffco schools jeffco transportation and engineering we got grants and had fundraisers and did donations. It starts at the West Jeff Elementary School driveway, and this trail then goes back along Sutton Road. There's the post office in the back, and continues to King Supers, and actually behind the King Supers, there is a continuation of a sidewalk, and uh, we'll show you on the map coming up here. Go ahead. Okay, so you can see um, here, let's look at the bottom first. That was before we put in the 
concrete trail and the students were walking along the road and it was a safety situation. And now afterward that's taken on the trail during the Christmas parade. So what we did, take a look up here and you can see the red arrow and that points to the solid orange line and that's the Sutton Road Trail. Then up at the top is the big white square, that's the King Supers, and that's the, where the trail goes actually behind it. And the purpose is so that when Meyer Ranch open space eventually moves in that direction, that will be a connecting trail. Okay, then we have the orange loop going south. And that makes it so that you can ride your bike or walk and make a whole loop around Conifer. So this is our 285 loop. Now, <clears throat> that part is where it's south of the highway. That is just gravel roads that are residential. There's not really trail signage, and it's not a trail, but they are um, seldom used sort of gravel roads. And then do you see the green to the right, the right side of our, your map? That is a trail from uh, the road there into Meyer Ranch, part of Meyer Ranch, of course, south of the highway. And um, we worked with Open Space and Conifer Area Council and Conifer Area Council urged open space to purchase that land and so there's a called a neighborhood trail there. There is no parking. Um, okay, I think we can go on to our next slide. Okay, this shows Conifer Road and the corner with Conifer Road and Davis. Here is under the underpass as you're going onto the highway, heading, heading towards Denver. And before, there was a little place under there, but it was just gravel. And then you couldn't get to it on foot from the King Super area because they had bowling ball size rocks called riprap. So we had them move that and rebuild it and now that's a whole sidewalk so now you can walk and end up there okay next one next one okay here's our new projects we are working on two new projects the barkley road trail and then a connection to conifer high school keep going kirk thank you okay we are working with West Jeff Elementary and the Little White Schoolhouse Museum so that we can improve the trail that <clears throat> runs along that side of the road so students can walk to the museum for a field trip. We are working with Jeffco Transportation and Engineering and also Open Space and we're trying to improve the trail that's in the right of way. Okay, next. Oh wait, don't go next yet. Okay, then the pink one, that is our uh, possible connection towards Conifer High School. So down at the bottom, that's Conifer High School, and we have several different ways of getting there. We're working with Conifer Community Church and St. Lawrence Church uh, and neighbors, property owners there, and CDOT. And so we're working on some of those things. Next one, please. So our fundraising includes grant writing, and we thank the Rotary Club of Conifer. We have had a 5K run for the past three summers. And this is a picture of some of the activities for the 5K run. 
We did that with Conifer area, or no, Conifer High School Club, and um, some of uh, the profits improved amenities for their athletic fields, and <clears throat> we got made a little bit of profit to use for matching funds for grants. <clears throat> Next one. <clears throat> so here's some runners. And here's one of our esteemed board members, Punky Kiefer, <laughs> on the right. And she is um, worthy of, <clears throat> excuse me, all applause because she works tirelessly for our trails team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. And I know we don't have all of the trails team here tonight, but everybody that has worked on the trails team, would you guys stand up? Come on. There's Kurt and Peter and Kathy, Brooke. Oh, come on. Don't we have more than that here? Okay. Well, there's a lot more that are working on it, but especially Punky Kiefer, who, like Brooke said, has worked tirelessly to get these trails done. So you need to go back and look at all they're doing and, and, and uh, thank them. Um, John Kaiser, our um, representative, is not here. <laughs> and um, I'm sure I don't, he has a brand new baby. And um, I, legislature is in session, right? So it seems like they always um, have late nights when they don't expect to. So he is not here tonight. So we'll, we'll have him at the next one. Um, there's a couple of announcements that I would like to give. Um, first of all, Conifer Area Council and Evergreen Newspapers are putting on um, Jefferson County School Board Candidates Forum, um, and that is going to is going to be totally nonpartisan. It should be <laughs> an easy night, hopefully. Um, Tuesday night, October 13th. It's going to be right here. There are um, flyers on the table, so please take one and please come to that. All of the, uh, most of the candidates, there might be one that's out of town, but most of them are going to be here. Then, um, as you probably all know, there is a Conifer Community Update being done right now with Jefferson County. Um, I think they've been getting some great um, meetings, a lot of people at the meetings, and maybe some of you have been there. Um, but there is one flyer back there, and I think Carol has been passing those out and asking you to give those back to us tonight so we can get them to the county. Um, they, we really want to get the community input for this. So please, please, please fill, there's just two questions, really easy, please fill that out and leave it with us on the table or give it to Carol or one of the Conferry Council people here tonight so we can be heard so that our community plan is what we want it to be, not what the county wants it to be. There is also a survey, a much broader survey, a lot, lot bigger survey, a lot more questions, that is online. There is information on those sheets, but we will also be getting an email out to everyone on the Conifera Council email list, um, asking you to go to that survey and take that survey so that the county knows what we want Conifer to look like, okay? So I think that's, um, most everything. We had a gentleman um, come to us and ask us what we wanted to see with the old Glory building, you know, where the llama, well, Angry Llama uh, restaurant and all of that. Does everybody know the old Glory building? Um, he wanted to have an idea or ideas from the community on what we wanted. He was unable to come tonight, but we will get an email out about that. So if you have um, information on what you think might be good in that building, you know, please let us know on that so we can get that information to the developers. Uh, let's see. There are lots of nonprofits here tonight. Um, all the speakers are here still to talk to you, to answer questions, um, and all of that. So please stick around for a little bit. And I want to again thank Mountain Hearth and Patio for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. And especially thank all of you for coming tonight. And again, if you could bring all your friends and neighbors to the next one, which will be November 18th. I think that's right. It's on, it's on your, it's on your um, handout. Shirley, can I just ask one question about the survey? When they're talking about question number one, 
what are the ramifications for being in the activity center and not being in the activity center? Okay. Um, what an activity center is, right now the activity center actually goes from about Kennedy Gulch Road to Eagle Cliff Road. And so the activity center mostly is for a little bit, you know, the commercial, a little bit higher development. However, each individual development, like the Meyer Ranch music that they're talking about, um, has their own parameters of what can be done there. Um, if, if you think that that should be in the community or in the activity center, I would suggest that you put information about that, that if you, know, you like the music festivals or whatever and the church and all that should be in the activity center, but they need to keep the um, hours to a certain amount, there need to be guidelines, you know, something like that. So an activity center normally is where there's a little bit more activity, where there's a little bit more commercial development, um, usually a little bit um, higher density housing. Okay. Okay. Since we're early, we can go ahead and take some. Usually we don't do this, but we'll take some questions. Go ahead. What we would like you to do, though, is get very, very involved in that. Peter, is that any? Where are you? Is that anything? Uh, you can talk to people afterwards, but this is not part of our forum. Um, Peter, is that part of um, anything that you've seen on development updates? Okay. Um, we will look into that and get information out to the community about it if there is something going on. Apparently, there's nothing yet. Um, Okay, so we'll, we'll check into that and we'll get information out to everybody on our email list. If you are not on our email list, um, who can, Carol is back at the table and she will get your email so that, um, what, um, Kind of Freight Council has a fairly um, extensive email list and the only thing that goes out for, to the email list is about the town hall meetings and anything that has something to do with the community. So if you want to be on that email list, please give your email to Carol. And um, we'll definitely, if, if there is, you'll try to get information out about this. We only do the Sorry. facts, not opinions. So. We will get information out about it probably tomorrow or Friday. So please go ahead and take the survey and, and let all your comments be known. Okay. okay? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. And please stick around to, uh, I think there's tickets for the high ground um, documentary and everything else. So thank you and we'll see you in November.